Thank you, sir. It's very nice to be here tonight. I have waited for this time with a great anticipation. We come to your fair city about six months ago, right after Christmas, and we've been sojourning here with you. And one day while out with Brother Tony uh, Strami, I, we fell on the idea that it would be nice to get better acquainted before we had to leave. And we thought it would be nice to have a little campaign down here to get the, we all get together and have some fellowship around the Word of God. And uh, many of these brethren I have met and I uh, visited some of their churches and found such a wonderful welcome. And I think it's a grand thing that we can all meet together for these few nights now to fellowship around the Word of God. Praise yeah. God. We are trusting that it'll be a great success to the glory of God in the upbuilding of the cause that Jesus died for. Amen. That is, that he might have a church without spot or wrinkle when he returns. Now, we don't represent any certain organization. We just come as the interdenominational to gather together with every Christian that we might have this fellowship together. And we are going to pray for the sick people. And many times when you mention praying for the sick, then they say a divine healer. No, I, I don't believe there is but one, and that's Christ. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we, sometimes they pin that on you as divine healer, but because you pray for the sick. But I do not believe that praying for the sick would make you any more of a divine healer than it would make you a divine savior to pray for the lost. Amen. So right. we know that we would not be a divine savior or a divine healer. We believe that all these great benefits that we enjoy today in this Christian economy we have was all purchased at Calvary by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. We believe that he was wounded for our transgressions. Yes. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was up on him, and with his stripes we were healed. It's all a past tense. It's something God has done for us at Calvary. And as Christians, we have the right to enjoy these blessings that he has purchased for us. So therefore, no man could save another. If it would have been so, Jesus would not have had to die. But when Jesus died at Calvary, he settled the sin question forever. Amen. And every man, every creature on earth, when he died, was saved at that very minute. Every, the price was paid completely. It was so met that God identified that it was true. Now, the only thing we have to do to receive this is to accept it, to believe it, and accept it. But no matter how much that he died for our salvation, we, we must ourselves accept it as our own personal experience, our, our own desire. We must want to be saved yes. and believe that upon the basis of his shed blood that we are saved after we have met the requirements of the Bible. I believe in the Bible being the full revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I do believe that God can do things that's not written in the Bible because He's God. But as long as we can find it in the Bible as a promise, then we know it's true because the, the Word is true always. And so we believe Him to keep His promise. I believe that He's Almighty. I believe He's infinite. Being infinite, He knows all things. He knows all things. A million years before there was a world, He knew we'd sit right here tonight. If it isn't, he isn't infinite. And if, he's, and if he isn't infinite, then he isn't God. So we believe that the Word, this Bible, is the Word of God. Amen. And therefore, that, that you can hang your soul upon any phase of it. Yeah. That's the only way you can have faith, is to believe you got... Faith has to have an anchoring place somewhere. And it must anchor on a place, and nothing could be more solid than the Word of God. Because the Word is God. That's, right. That's what the Bible teaches. Therefore, when God says anything in here 
a believer can punctuate it with an amen. amen. Anything yes. that he says. Now, because him being infinite, omnipotent, omnipresent, he cannot be one without the other, and to be God, he has to be all of it. Now, therefore, as being finite, like we are, this year we can work on something and we think we got it perfect. Next year, maybe tomorrow, we have to change your mind. It's different. We found something better because we, we're finite, but he's infinite. So when he says a word, it's forever that way. It can never be improved. It can never be taken back. If God was called on the scene, in any case, in the way God acted on that scene the first time, he must forever act the same way when he's called on the scene again. Because if he'd act different than he did the first time, then uh, there's something wrong. He, he, it could not be perfect. See, therefore he acted wrong when he acted the first time, if he acted the second time different than he did the first. Therefore, when God made a remedy for man to be saved in the Garden of Eden, he, they tried to improve his remedy through 6,000 years and could never touch it. He made upon the basis of the shed blood of an innocent victim, and he's never changed it. We've tried to educate people to Christ. We've tried to denominate them to Christ. We've tried all kinds of systems, but they've all failed. There's only one place that man can meet on a common ground and of worship, and that is under the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been that way from the beginning, because he cannot change it. It's always the blood, the blood. And today, when we think that we're different from the other fellow and so forth, it just does not work. We must still accept that basis of the shed blood. And therefore, when God was called on the scene to heal a man, he healed the man upon the basis of his faith. And when he's called on the scene again, he'll heal the next man the same way. Or he acted wrong. If God ever did heal a man because he believed, and then the next man calls with the same kind of faith, God's obligated to do the same thing to the next man if not his respected person and acted wrong in the first place. So you see, back to the Word. I, I believe it with all my heart. Now, we are... Expecting God to do great things for us. And we want, when we leave, to see a blessing left in this city. And I know you'll be a blessing to me. For wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he promised to be there. Yes. Now, if that isn't so, then we're all lost and the Bible's wrong. Yes. That makes Jesus Christ here now. Yes. If that isn't so, then what are we preaching? What are we believing? He's here. Wherever two or three are assembled in my name, I'm in the midst of them. Now, we must act then and believe and, and believe that he is here and act like he's here. And remember, he watches us after we leave here also. And we're trusting that every unsaved person will be saved during this campaign. We're trusting that there will not be an empty seat in every one of these churches here that's represented from this time on. And I trust that there will be an old-fashioned, God-sent revival break out through Tucson here that will just send thousands of souls into the kingdom of God. I believe that's the will of God. That's his desire tonight. And there's no one person can do it by themselves. It takes us all together to pull together, to pray together, to stand together in unity in the Spirit and pray for this. Brethren's been telling me that the churches has had prayer meetings prior to this meeting. And I'm so thankful for that. It'll, when you gather together to pray like that, it changes the whole atmosphere when we pray. Now, we will not try to keep you long in the, each evening because I know you must get out and go to your work. So we'll try each night to let you out early so that you can return the next night. And this is just a little visit that we come together. And uh, we are just got the four nights, I believe it's, I think that's right, Wednesday, Thursday, right? Yeah. All right, four nights, and then we end here in the same auditorium for a businessman's breakfast a Saturday morning, which uh, the public is invited. Now, uh, I'm a, not a stranger. I don't feel like a stranger among you. I'm, I'm your brother. And um, so 
So I hope that you feel the same way about me. Amen. And now before we approach the word, let's approach the author of the word while we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who raised him up from the dead and has kept him alive all these years, and he's alive forevermore, reigning in our hearts tonight, taking control to lead us and guide us. May we all be surrendered to his divine will, that he might lead us in the way that he would have us go. We want to thank you, Father, for this marvelous opportunity to present Jesus Christ in the way of the great, mighty healer, the great Savior of man, the satisfier to ever longing heart, health to the sick, salvation to the lost, coming King to the saints. Oh, God, inspire us all tonight. I thank you for these men, these shepherds of the flocks of this city, these minister brethren who has their little outpost all along the city where they're feeling constantly for the Spirit of God to come in on the, the waves of the, of the Holy Spirit, move in to their midst and tell them what they must do how they must lead the sheep. And tonight it's seemingly, Lord, as a message swept down through those waves that all agreed that we must come together in this service. Now come, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the Ramada Inn and for its open arms to receive the gospel. Let us come here to worship in this uh, air-conditioned building. Father God, we pray that there will not be a lost person go out of this building without being saved. Grant it, Lord. May the, if the staff of this building uh, in this great Ramada is not saved, we pray, God, that you'll save them. Heal the sickness around here. May it come to pass that people will walk in this auditorium and weep under the power of the Holy Spirit. Grant it, Lord. We long for these things, and we believe it's your divine will to reveal it to us now and to show us your presence, that you're here and ever alive with us forevermore. Bless us as we put forth our feeble efforts. May the Holy Spirit come in, and may we not think our own thoughts, but may we have our minds open to the great unction of his presence that we might know his mind to fulfill which is written in the scripture, let the mind that was in Christ be in you. Bless us, our Father, and when we leave the service tonight, may we say as we go to our homes, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way, as it did one day long ago of the first witness of the resurrection, as Theophilus and his friend was returning back from the city. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Many people kind of take scriptures that the evangelists would, would read from. And I wish tonight just to take a few verses of scripture and try to explain them in my humble way that you might see Jesus Christ. I want you to turn with me now to the book of St. John, the 12th chapter and the 20th verse, if you'd like to follow me as we read. St. John 20, or St. John 12, 20 and 21. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, of Galilee. And desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And then in the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and the 8th verse, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I wish to make this as a text 
uh, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was standing a church Sunday night here in the city, one of your fine churches, and here I've tried to visit as many as I could since we've been in the city and found great fellowship and welcome with the Assemblies of God, the Baptists and the uh, Anderson Church of God, and many more that have visited. And on this church at the back of the, of the pulpit had the scripture, like a Bible, written, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's kind of been a theme with me in the campaigns, that I would use that because I believe the entire book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then, for I'd like to build from a context, the sirs, we would see Jesus. And I, I believe tonight that every man and woman in here would freely feel that these Greeks express the feelings of us all. For they had heard about Jesus, and now they wanted to see him. I, I believe that, that there's no man that can hear the wonderful story of Jesus Christ, but what he longs in his heart to get to see him. That's, the, the, that's the, the believer's desire, is to see him. And I don't care whether he's short, tall, or what he is, I love him, I want to see him. Amen. And the one who saved me and has done for me what he's done, I, I long Amen. to see him. Now, there's no doubt that these Greeks were proselytes to the Jewish religion, because we see it was the feast of the Passover where the Paschal Lamb was killed. And these Greeks being among them, now the Greeks were a, of a very high, a talented people. They were leading the world in art and highly educated in science. And they were great people. And they were scholars. They read many books. And, and something, they had must have got a hold of, of something that in the human heart longing to find something that quenches that great thirst that comes in a human heart. Did you ever think why a man would do wrong? It's because he's trying to satisfy a thirst that God put in his heart to thirst after him. Yeah. And then he tries to satisfy it with the things of the world. And it'll never be satisfied until it's quenched by God himself that Amen. he can come in and satisfy that great longing and thirst in the human heart. There's just so much of a man that won't fill up. Nothing else can take its place until God takes his right position in the human heart. And these Greeks had heard and no doubt had been reading the Old Testament. And they had heard about the coming Messiah and what he should be when he arrived. And they had longed to see what God would be when he would be manifested in the flesh. What a man would look like that would be filled uh, to the capacity until the fullness of the Godhead would be in him. Yes. What would he be? And they had heard about Jesus that claimed to be this person, the Messiah that the Jews for thousands of years that looked for this coming one, where God himself would be made human in the form of his son, in order to bleed and die, for there was no man could die for the other because we were all guilty together. Yes. One man could not save the other. And there had to be a man who was worthy in the old laws of the ministers, those of the kinsman redeemer. It had to, God had to become kinfolks to us. And he crossed his, his tent and came down from being God, the great Jehovah, and was made flesh in the form of his Son, that God might be manifested and be worthy and kinfolks to us, that he might die to take away our sins, to save his own creation. Oh, the story is so great. There's no way to approach it, uh, to know the real, how you could express it. There's not, it isn't on the human tongue that could express what love that is, that Amen. God would 
come down the Creator to save His own creation. Now we find these Greeks thirsting. They had heard, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing of the Word. The Bible said so, Hebrews. said, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing of the Word of God. Now they had heard that there was to be a Messiah. So then they come to see. They, they come to see this person that was to be that Messiah who was believed among the people was that Messiah. Now that's the same position that we set tonight. We have heard about God. We've been taught about God. Through the years we've had churches, great churches, great man, great evangelists. But I believe we're living in the shadow of the coming of the Lord Jesus. When this church has come from justification under Luther, sanctification under Wesley, into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Amen. and coming to the perfect church without spot or wrinkle, that yes. through the, that church that God might redeem back all the blood-washed saints and yes. take them home yes. down to the age. Amen. And we're, the, we're becoming more Christ-like and more in the minority all the time. Now, we find that these men hungering, they come to see what this man looked like. And they ask the question, Sirs, we would see Jesus. Now, they'd heard about him, heard others speak of him, read of him in the Bible, but they wanted to see him. Now, to my text, the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then, if these men was desirous to see him, and God made a way that their anticipation could be satisfied. He made a way that they could see him by one of his servants. Now, if, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we have the same sincere desire to see him, isn't he obligated to show himself among us? Amen. Now, that's a great big statement. But... If the Bible isn't right, then where are we at? But the Bible said he's the same. And if he, he can't be just the same in some manner, he's got to be the same in every manner that he ever was. He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And these Greeks wanted to see him because faith had come by hearing, and they come and was satisfied, went away knowing that that was the Messiah. Now... If we are desirous tonight to see this one who we go to church, whether we feel like it or not, and where we are church, we pay our tithings, is it to a myth? Is it to just a, a building that we're paying to? Is this man who is our pastor just an impersonator of something there's nothing to? Is the Christian religion like Greek mythology or Roman mythology or something? It's just a myth? Or is it a reality? Now, to me, this Bible is either right or it's wrong. Amen. Yes, that's right. Every word is true or there's none of it true. Amen. That's right. And now, if he made this promise, then it's not you and I obligated to this promise. It's not you and I obligated to prove this promise. He's the one's under obligation because he was the one who said it. Amen. Now, we're only quoting what he said. That he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And here's how many here would like to see him? Just, just for, say so, raise your hands. I, I like, now, I, there was two there, only two that wanted to see him. And here's two or three hundred wants to see him. Well, then why can't we see him if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Hallelujah. Now, that's the way we want to look at it. It's either the truth or it isn't the truth. And that's why I expressed it the first time. This Bible as either the truth or it isn't the truth. Therefore, when the Bible says anything, you can just hold on to it. For God's obligated to this word. For he was the one who made the promise. God said so. All right, it's so. Now, it will depend on what you're looking for. You usually get what you look for. Yes, you do. I want you to remember that. Now, if you want to see God, God can be seen. If you want to hear God, God can be heard. Just as he was yesterday, so is he today. He doesn't change. Now, 
It reminds me of a little story, yet it's true. Uh, I live in Indiana, my native home. I'm a Kentuckian by birth, and we live by the Ohio River. Enough water goes through there a day to make lettuce grow all over Arizona. <laughs> Millions of gallons of water have passed down that dam, and it looks like there's some way we could bypass it. we got more than we need there. It's almost a swamp, and, and you need the water here. But it will be someday in that great millennium it is to come, yes, when sin is taken from the earth, and then things will be right. There was an old fisherman lived down that river. He was a deacon in my church. His name was Wiseheart, a very fine old man. And there was a certain Sunday school uh, in our city, a fine church, a great, fine, internationally known denomination of fellowship, fine pastor, and fine people. And there was a certain family in our city that went to this church, and there was a little boy in this family who got real enthused one day after hearing so many flannel graph uh, readings and so forth. He said to his mother, he said, Mama, if God is a great God as you say he is, could anyone see him? She said, Son, you should ask your Sunday school teacher. Mother's not able to tell you that. So he went to the Sunday school teacher and he said, Teacher, I would like to ask you something. You tell me about great God said that's so great and he opens the Red Sea for the Israelites and he makes the sun to shine and he whirls the earth perfectly in time and it's our but and uh, so forth said uh, could anyone see him she said that's too deep for me you'll have to ask the pastor so he got to the pastor and he said pastor uh, could anyone see God said he's so great I hear you speak from him from the pulpit telling how great he is said could anyone see him he said, no, son, no one could see me. He said, because you just can't see God, that's all. We just have to believe it. Well, the little fellow, it didn't suffice it. So he, one day he was with the old uh, brother, uh, fisherman on the river, and they went up to what's called the Six Mile Island. It's six miles an island from Louisville, Kentucky, to this uh, island. They'd been fishing up there, and they'd caught a good catch of fish, and on the road down, there come up a storm. And there we have many storms, that, that wet country, lightning and thunder and great gushes of rain. And, and so after the, they had to go to the shore and get behind trees. And after the storm was over, they went back in their boat and started down. It was in the evening time or the afternoon, rather. And the sun setting back over here in Tucson somewhere. It was reflecting its light in the sky. And there was a rainbow came out across the the eastern horizon and uh, the old fisherman was paddling his boat with his oars as everything fresh the rain had washed the dust off and it's a lovely time and only a man who's used to the oars can appreciate that rhythm of the tipping of the oars as the boat glides its way through the water his white beard hanging down and he uh, kept watching that rainbow and the little boy, enthused, looked around to see what the old gentleman was looking at. And he noticed the old fisherman, the crystal tears dropping off of his white beard. And the little boy sitting in the bow of the boat become so uh, enthused till he rushed towards the stern of the boat and said to the old fisherman, Sir, I'm going to ask you a question that my mother, nor my Sunday school teacher, nor my pastor could, could satisfy my longing to know something. He said, what is it, son? He said, can anyone see God? And the old fisherman, so overcome by his, the little fellow's uh, question, pulled the oars into the boat and threw his arms around the little boy and the tears run down his cheeks. He said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 50 years has been God. <laughs> See? Hey, you can get so much God on the inside that you can see him anywhere you look. Amen. But until that desire to see him, Amen. you won't see him. You can see him in the sunset. You can hear him in the call of the bird. You can watch him everywhere. He's on every hand. But the old man had so much God inside of him, 
He, he could see God everywhere. And I think that's kind of the way we ought to look for God. We can see God anywhere we look. Now, but we're back to Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, how would, how would we know if I said the Methodist people, do you believe that? They'd say, Amen. And I'd say, Baptist, do you believe it? Amen. Pentecostals, Church of God, and so forth, do you believe it? Amen. We believe it. And I'm glad you do. I believe it too. But now, what if we went around the city to find Jesus Christ? What type of a person would we look for? Now, he promised to be with us tonight. Now, if that isn't so, then the word isn't so. You see, well, that isn't just inspired. Then to me, the rest of it isn't inspired. I don't know which is or which isn't inspired if it all isn't the truth. Amen. 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 I can't pick it out. It's just all of the word of God. And now... Now, he promised that he would be right here tonight, wherever two or three are assembled together. Do you believe that? Amen. Thank you. Now, then, if he is, what type of a person would we look for if we went to look for him? Uh, would, we, would we try to find a man that was wearing a robe and uh, had long hair and beard? Would that, could that be Jesus? Just... Anybody could wear a, a robe and have long hair and beard. Any imposter could do that. There's a many man wearing a robe tonight that knows no more about God than a hot and top would know about an Egyptian knight. That's right. But if, uh, it isn't that we look for. We look for some uh, dignitary because he wasn't. Uh, what would we look for for nail scars and prints of thorns? Any impersonator could dress himself up like that. It still wouldn't be him. And how do we know that he had uh, a robe on and how he dressed? We only know it. Would you look like the pictures that we see, the, the painter's paint? No, that's a psychological painting that some man had his conception of what Christ would look like. And if we had to go with that, which one would be right? There's Hoffman, Selman, and how many more? All different descriptions of him. So you'd be a bit confused what he would look like. Would he look like Hoffman's painting of him or Selman or some of the rest of them? We don't know. If Hoffman's right, then Selman's wrong. See? Selman's right, then Hoffman's wrong. And see, you wouldn't know what to look for. But how would we identify him? Well, we would identify him the same way that he identified himself in the beginning. Yes. Right. By his works. Well, what he done? If I do not the works of my Father, he said, then don't believe me. But if I do the works so you don't believe, believe the works. For they are they that testify of me. They tell what I am. We'd have to find out then that uh, what made him manifested, what identified Jesus Christ in yesterday would be the same thing that would have to identify him today. Amen. Now, we Methodists think our church identifies him. We would think that our, we Baptists would think our church identified him. And we Pentecost, see, I'm all of them, <laughs> that we would, we think it ours identified him. Reminds me, of, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. There might be some of my fine Arkansas friends here. They, one night at the Robinson Memorial Auditorium, there was a, a beggar sat on the street that had uh, crutches and he sold pencils. And he got healed. And the next day, he was walking around with these crutches on his shoulders, testifying. And he's up in the third balcony, and he just taken the whole floor up there, and we couldn't hardly preach because of the noise. And he is shouting and carrying on, being all up and down the streets in every business place, testifying, sitting on the corner. And he's called out in the audience, and the Lord Jesus made him well. And so he said, I want to ask you a question, Brother Branham. I said, what is it, sir? He said, you know, he was a Nazarene. He said, I heard you preaching, and I thought you was a Nazarene. And said, I seen so many Pentecostals around, then somebody told me he was a Pentecostal. And said, then I heard somebody said that you belong to Missionary Baptist Church. Said, what about this? I said, it's all true. I'm a Pentecostal Nazarene Baptist. <laughs> that's, it. that's it. See, we are born of the Spirit of God, then we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and these uh, brands don't mean nothing. I used to herd cattle and up here in, uh, where I worked on a ranch and, and up in Colorado. 
and the Hereford Association grazes the valley there and the Troublesome River, and we got a drift fence and where the herders put their cattle up. The ranger stands there counting those cattle as they go through. I stood there many times with my leg over the horn of the saddle, watching the ranger. Now there's all kinds of brands goes through there. Every brand on the valley goes through. The ranger wasn't noticing the brands, but he was watching for the blood tag. Now that blood tag meant that that had to be a thoroughbred herder, or it could not graze on that from that valley. It could not go in without a blood tag. Now I thought one day sitting there. I got the shout, and I said, you know, that's where it's going to be at the judgment. He ain't going to notice what brand I got, but where we got the blood tag. That's the thing. When, when he sees the blood, we can go in. That's all. And our brands will be long forgotten at that time. That's right. And I'm so glad of that. It's true. Now, what, now, if we can see how he identified himself yesterday, then we'll know what he would be today because he would identify himself the same today that he was yesterday. Is that true? Amen. Then he would do the works of God. Now he wouldn't be dressed. He wouldn't have a certain education. We have no record of him going to school. And he wouldn't be a certain eloquent speaker because we find that his language was so, so poor until the common people heard him gladly. See? So he would be uh, just a man. But what would identify him would be the identification that the Scripture says that he would be. And that's how we would have to identify him. And that's the way he was identified then because he wasn't any spectacular man in a certain uh, array of dress. He had no organization that he boasted of. He had no, no uh, credentials from any certain fellowship that he could say, I belong to the biggest. Or, see, he only had the works of God that was proven and spoke of that would identify him. And that was his credentials. That was it. Who can condemn me of sin? And sin is unbelief. See? Which one of you can condemn me? If I haven't done just exactly what well, I was supposed to do, then you tell me where I failed, in other words. See? Now, that's the way it would be today, identified. Now, let's find out then how he was identified in that day. Was it by a certain fellowship? Was it by a certain form of education? Was it by a certain scientific mark that he had? Or was it by a scriptural uh, evidence that he proved himself that he was the Son of God? Search ye the scriptures, he said, for they are they that testify of me. The Scriptures is what testifies of him. So that's what identified him was the Scriptures. You believe that? Amen. That's what we have to identify him today then. And then we know whether we were right or not, whether it was him. He was the same. He would do the same. Now, let's take now we read from St. John, and let's just take it quietly for the next 10 or 15 minutes and then see if he'll appear and prove he's God. See, see if he's still alive. We believe that he's not dead. That's one thing. I'm a missionary. I preach printer in every nation under the heavens, seven times around. And I have seen all kinds of religions, stood before witch doctors and every cult I guess there is, as far as I know. And yet, every one of them, Buddha, Mohammed, Sikh, James, whatever it might be, they all have a founder, and every founder is dead. They can mark his grave. And there he lays. There's his bone. Yes, yes. But Christianity, there's an empty tomb. Yes. 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 And the good thing about it, we, we, he proves that he's alive. I mean, yes. He's here now. See? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that's the thing that a Christian can rest upon, that we know that all the rest of the tombs are full, but this one, there's an empty tomb. He is not here, but he is risen. Hallelujah. And we're going to tell the brethren... This good news. And he is sure. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Now we'll start out with St. John, then we read in St. John. And every book in the Bible will declare the same message. It has to. If it isn't, it isn't scriptural. Now, we find out that when he was born, here in the first chapter of St. John, we'll start the first chapter. When he was born... We know his birth and how the angel Gabriel announced it and Mary, his mother, and how he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and how at the age of 30 years old he was baptized by his cousin, um, John, our second cousin, John the Baptist, and immediately he was taken into the wilderness for temptation for 40 days, then returned back 
in the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he returned to his ministry. And remember, he forbid the disciples to preach anymore or do anything until they went in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Wait ye in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Hallelujah. You're not to go out until it's not you, but God. The people can see the reflection of Jesus Christ in you. Then the people will believe them. Because it won't be you, it'll be him. And all that he foreknew, he'll call. They'll see it. My sheep know my voice. Now we notice that then immediately when he entered into his ministry, I'm going to call a few characters. Now I want you to remember one thing. There's only three races of people on the earth. Well, we have many nationalities, but there's only three. And that's from Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. That was Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. And we find out when the Holy Spirit was given... Peter given the keys, he opened it to the, to the Jews at uh, Pentecost, at Jerusalem, to the Samaritans, and also to the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius, Acts 10, 49. And from then, it's been in the world for all the races. And he had the keys to open it to these races. Now, the Gentiles were not looking for any Messiah. We were heathens. We Anglo-Saxons. We had clubs on our backs and worshipped idols. And we wasn't looking for no Messiah. But the Jews were looking for a Messiah. And the Samaritans were looking for a Messiah, which were half Jew and Gentile. Now, we know that he only comes and identifies himself to those who are looking for him. And that's the way it will be at his second coming. The world will know nothing about him. He'll just come take his church and be gone. And those who are not looking for him will be left behind. He's only coming to those who are looking for him. Now, he came to his own race, to the Jews. Now, let's watch how he identified himself. The first thing we find was Andrew here and Philip. And Andrew had heard of Jesus, and they went down because they'd been disciples of John. And as they went down and they had found his great works and they went home with him, come back the next morning fully satisfied that that was the Messiah. Now we find out that Andrew goes and finds his brother, Simon, which was far later called Peter. Now, if you'll study the history of Simon Peter, he and Andrew, they came from a very religious home, a Pharisee. Their father was a great, staunch believer. And he had told his son, now sons, there will come up. We've all looked down through the age for the coming Messiah since the very promise in the Garden of Eden. But now, before he comes, there will be a, quite a bit of confusion because Satan is going to throw out every counterfeit that he can. See? To block the real thing. He always does that. That's right. He's always does that. But remember, where you see a bogus dollar, it's got to be a real dollar somewhere that it was made off of. When you see somebody playing the part of a hypocrite, just remember there's a genuine article somewhere that he's impersonating. So, no doubt that that would happen. But said, now, sons, here's what you remember. We've got to believe the message of the Bible. And Moses, our servant... The servant of God who gave us our commandments and our laws. He said that the Lord our God would raise up a prophet among us. Liken unto him. And now when Messiah comes, the Bible says that he will be a prophet. And you know that we're, we're told that we receive a prophet only after he is identified by God to be a prophet. And all you Bible readers know that the word of the Lord came to the prophets. That's right. That only. The word came to the prophets only. And the only way that this man would be identified that in 400 years, Malachi would have been the last prophet. And now he said, this Messiah, when he comes, there may be false messiahs raise up. There may be all kinds of things happen. But when he comes, God will identify him. He'll be a prophet. The Bible says he'll be a prophet. And the Bible said, 
If there be one among you who is spiritual or prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him, speak to him through visions and so forth. And if what he says comes to pass, then hear him. But if it doesn't come to pass, then don't hear him. Now, that's just as honest and just as that sense. If what he says is right, it has to be right every time. You just can't guess at it. It's got to be right. If it is right, it's got to be God. And if it isn't right, then it isn't God. So that's just, and so they knew to believe that. All Jews knew that. The true Jews. But in that day, the church had got something like it is today, kind of soft and off on creeds and gone off on uh, class and complications of the, and washing pots. And as Jesus said, you've tucked your traditions and made the commandments of God of no effect to you by their traditions. It's what they had did. A lot like today. A repeat of time. Now, notice this. Now, when Andrew was satisfied that that was the Messiah, the Bible doesn't record just what he did, but he went and got Peter, or his name was Simon then. And he said, Simon, I want you to come and hear this man. The prophet down on Jordan said this man would come, and the prophet said that... He saw the Spirit of God like a dove coming up on him. And he knew this was the Son of God. I want you to come hear him. There's a light, a sign that follows him. So I'd imagine Simon is a little reluctant about coming. But finally, when he walked up into the presence of Jesus, now think of it now. We're going to find out the credentials, the identification, what he was. And when, I'm still in St. John, the first chapter. And when... Jesus saw Simon coming to him. He said, Behold an Israelite. He spoke and knew him. He said, Thy name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. That took the starch out of him. How did he know his name was Simon? And how did he know that godly old father before him had taught him the way? He knew that must be Messiah. It was a prophet. And immediately he fell at his feet without education, without any uh, any experience behind it, and was so consecrated to Jesus Christ giving the keys to the kingdom and made him the head of the church of Jerusalem. For as soon as that... Jesus identified himself by saying, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas, which was his father. That had made Jesus perfectly that prophet. Peter believed it. Now, we find there was one standing there by the name of Nathaniel. Or Philip, I believe it was. Philip was standing by. And he saw this. So he was a staunch Israelite. And he knew where there was a brother that they'd studied together. Now, if you've ever been in Jerusalem and see where Jesus was preaching and how far Philip had to go, it's a day's journey around the mountains to where his friend Nathaniel was, which was a Bible student. So he takes off immediately after he had found what was the truth. He had seen it work. He was satisfied that was Messiah. Oh, if we could only have that enthusiasm. If we could only get that same something within us. When we know we have found that pearl. Around the mountain he went. No doubt that he found Nathaniel come to his home and... And maybe he would knock on the door and his wife said he's, he's out in the vineyard. He probably raised olives. And he went out in the vineyard and being a Christian gentleman, he didn't bother him while he was praying. He was on his knees praying. Maybe he's praying like this. Lord God Jehovah, I'm growing old and I've looked and longed to see the Messiah. Let me see him before I go. And as soon as he said, Amen, and got up, then stood Nathaniel. Now I noticed not a whole lot of carrying on. He had a he had a commission. The thing of it is today we got too much bypassing and doing other things. Let's get to the mark. 
Is he God or isn't he God? Is he the same yesterday and forever or isn't he the same? Is he, is he still the Jesus? Is he raised from the dead? Has he raised? Amen. If he hasn't, then forget it. If he has, let's get our enthusiasm started. Let's get filled with his spirit. Get to praying and start a meeting. Do something. Notice, he went straight to the point. Come see who we have found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, I imagine this very orthodox man uh, brushed off his, his uh, clothing from being kneeling in the dust that wait a minute here, Philip. I've known you to be a sensible man, but you perhaps went off on the deep end, you know. Now here, we study the scripture together, and we know that, what you say, Jesus of Nazareth? Now, do you mean to tell me that Almighty God would go to such a low-down bunch as that down there at Nazareth, way worse than Tucson, and go down there and or Jeffersonville, where I come from, way down there to that mean city, and pick up something down there? Why, you know the high priest believes that he'll let the carters down out of heaven walk right down in the yard, you know, and we've been taught that. But, you know, he don't always come the way we think he comes. See, he comes so humble. The people's got it all fixed up the way they want him to come. And we, we walk over humility. And there's where you find God. Scientists today can send a man into space in an orbit and walk over a blade of grass that he knows nothing about. Yeah. Oh, you've got to humble yourself to know God. You've got to get rid of your own ideas and just open up your heart and life to him. Then he'll make himself known. Well, I could hear him say, could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Could there be anything out of that, holy rollers or whatever you want to call it? If anything is going to be done, it would be done in my denomination. and mine, see? That's where it would come. Could there be anything good come from such a bunch as that? Now, I think Philip gave him the best answer that any man could. He said, come see. Don't stay home and criticize it. Come find out for yourself. Come and see. Bring your Bible along and check it. See if it's right. That's what everybody ought to do. See? Come see. Let's break in on their conversation as you went along the shores of the Galilee coming around. I can imagine hearing him say this. Do you remember that old, you know, we've, we've taught the Bible together. We've sat together in heavenly places as we look upon the Bible and know that someday. Now, Nathaniel, I want to ask you something. What will Messiah be when he comes? How will we know he's Messiah? Why, Nathaniel being a good Bible student said, well, he'll be a prophet. Sure, the Bible said he'd be a prophet. All right, then we'll know him. Do you know that old ignorant fisherman down there that you bought that fish from that day and he didn't have enough education to sign the receipt? Yeah, I remember him. Simon, yeah, son of Jonas. When his brother went and got him and brought him up to where he was, he stood and looked him right in the face and said, your name is Simon and you're the son of Jonas. You know, it wouldn't surprise me, Nathaniel, but what he'd say, your name's Nathaniel when you get there. Okay? Ah, I have to see, you know, seeing's believing, even out of Missouri. So we come to find out that there they went on the road, and as soon as Nathaniel got in the presence of Jesus Christ, what did he do? What happened when he got where Jesus was? He said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no God. Well, that sure deflated the man. And he said, Rabbi, which means teacher, when did you ever know me? I've never seen you in my life. I live 15 miles around the mountain here. And I never even heard of you until yesterday afternoon. And here I come around and you, and you tell me that I'm an Israelite. Or you say it was because of the way he was dressed. Oh, no. All the Easterners dressed like that and wore beard. You are an Israelite in whom there is no God. Now, what about that? He said, Rabbi, when did you ever see me? He said, yesterday when you were under the tree before Philip called you, I saw you. <laughs> Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and today. What did he say? His priest might have been standing there. There might have been a lot of critics standing there, which there was. But he ran up to him and he said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Amen. His name is indelible tonight. It's wrote in the Lamb's Book of Life. There was those standing by, of course, who didn't believe that. 
certainly. They said, this man is a fortune teller. He's Beelzebub. And Jesus turned around. Wow, they had to answer their congregation for something. The works had been done. It, it, it was there. So he said, this man is Beelzebub, a fortune teller, telepathist or something. Jesus said to them, you speak that against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven you. But someday the Holy Ghost is coming. And if you speak to do the same thing, and if you speak a word against that, it'll never be forgiven you. In this world or in the world that is to come, right. it's never to be forgiven. Amen. Now, that was the generation we're in now. Now, we got the first generation identified. We can pull more, but let's go now because we're going to have to start the prayer line. There was the, the Jews, the real Orthodox, real Christian, God-called believers recognize that right now. Then one day he was going down to Jericho, but he had need to go by Samaria. Wonder why. They were looking for a Messiah. But we Gentiles wasn't. But now we are looking for a Messiah. See, See we've had 2,000 years like they had 2,000 years. See? But we've had 2,000 years looking for him. We've heard of him. But now we're looking for him to come the second time. And now we notice that he had need to go up to Samaria. That's up on the mountain. And when he went up to Samaria, it must have been around noon, so he sent his disciples into the city to buy victuals. From the city came a little woman. Now, if, you want, if I had time, I could break that down and tell you why she come at that time of day. All the decent women has to come together. The honorary and the decent are not associated together. They cannot be caught in public at the same time, even to this day. Now, she was marked a woman of ill fame. You know what I'm talking about. Prostitute. Now, we find out that she come up there about 11 o'clock in the day to get draw water. And let's think she's a very attractive woman. And she had her water vase on her shoulder and it uh, kind of comes up. I've seen them put one pot on their head and one on each hip and walk, talk like women can and never spill a drop of it. And they put a balance. I don't know how they do it. But you're walking along, and she had this, it's got two handles on it, and then you go to the well, it's got a window, and you let it down and get the water and then draw it back up. And this was Jacob's well, where Jesus, just outside the city, it was a public well, and where Jacob had dug the well and watered his animals there, and so he had drank from it himself. And so we find this woman coming up to get her water, and she started to let down the pot. Let's think that she was thinking of the nights before, and... And she let, started to let the windle down as she hooked the hooks over the, the uh, arms of the vase to let it down to get the water. And she heard a man say, bring me a drink. And the, the well there, if he's ever there, it's a little panoramic, something like this here tonight. And there's a, a vines grows over the wall. And so this Jew was sitting over against the wall. And she looked over there and she saw this Jew sitting there against the wall. And she said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask a Samaritan anything. We have no dealings with one another. Otherwise, there was a segregation. And uh, we have no dealings one with another. And you being a man and ask me, a Samaritan woman, to bring you a drink. And he was an ordinary Jew. He wasn't dressed any different. He was a man, I think they said in St. John 6, he was only about 32 years old. But he looked, must have looked 50 because he said, you're a man not over 50 years old. And yet you say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. But don't, do not come here to draw. Why, well, she said, the well's deep. And what have you to do with it? How can you draw it? He said, the waters that I give is waters in the soul. And the conversation went on. Now, you have to take my word for this. He was contacting her spirit. Now, she was a woman, one woman come out of Samaria. And he said, um, uh, our fathers drank of this well. And, and you say you got waters that's greater than this? And she said, and you say worship at Jerusalem and our fathers worship in this mountain and so forth. The conversation kept going on. After a while, when he found out just where her trouble was, how many knows what her trouble was? Sure. He found where her trouble was. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. I remember, what's he doing? Identifying himself to the Samaritans now. That's how he done it to the, the Jews. Now watch what this Samaritan's going to say. He said, uh, go get your husband and, and come here. Well, she said, I have no husband. He said, 
you told the truth. Saying you have no husband because that you've had five and the one you're living with now is not yours. And you said the truth. Now, watch that woman, that Samaritan woman, her respond to that. She know more about God than half the people of the United States. <laughs> Certainly. Including <laughs> ministers sometimes. <laughs> See? Look at those priests down there. When they seen that done, they said, This man's a fortune teller. He's Beelzebub. Yeah. Trying to figure out some way that he did it. Some trick, some hoax. See? But this little woman said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Yeah. Amen. Watch. We know, we know that there is a Messiah coming called Christ. And when he comes, this is what he'll do. <laughs> he said, I'm he that speaks to you. That was enough. She knew that was, was what she did. She rushed into the city and she told the man of the city, Come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the mark of the very Messiah? When have we ever had it since the time? Here is the real Messiah. That's how he identified himself with the Jews. That's how he identified himself with the Samaritans. Now, that was the end of their time. Now, the Gentiles has had 2,000 years of teaching like they had thousands of years of teaching. But if the Gentiles don't get the same thing that they got, then he's a respected person. So how would we know him today? When he stood with us and in us and worked through us and proved that this spirit that we call the baptism of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ and persifying himself in the form of spirit in the human being, doing the same he said in St. John, the 14th chapter, the 12th verse, He that believeth, not make believeth, but he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Amen. Isn't that true? He said in St. John 5, 19, he passed through the pool of Bethesda. I'm still, that's fourth chapter of St. John. Now I'm in the fifth chapter. In the fifth chapter of St. John, he passed through the pool of Bethesda. There laid a great multitude. It takes 2,000 to make one multitude. So there's multitudes of people in this great spiritual hospital, as it were, laying at the sheep gate, waiting for the moving of the water. God has always had a way of divine healing for believers. Amen. And the angel came down and troubled the water. And you know what a troubled water is? See, it's the current going one way and the wind whipping around another. So troubled water. It was that angel coming on the water, whirling it around. And the first one stepping in with faith took the virtue off the water and got healed. Jesus passed through this group of people there and he knew where a certain man was laying that had had an infirmity 38 years. He probably had prostate trouble or, or something. He wasn't going to kill him. It was retired. He had it 38 years. And he walked to him and said, Will thou be made whole? Why didn't he say to the lame, halt, blind, or afflicted? They was in there with waterhead babies. The Bible said they were lame, blind, halt. This man could walk. He said, when I'm coming down, somebody steps ahead of me. But remember, he knew this man had been there. You get it? And he said, take up your bed and go into your house. There's no question about that. He went on. For he knew he'd do it. They found him packing his bed on the Sabbath day. He was called in. It would be the same thing tonight. If a, if a man tonight, God bless you, brother, to receive it. If a man tonight was healed and could prove it, that he was healed, nor is it in himself, but he was healed with a prostrate trouble, what do you think would take place tomorrow? Somebody would be saying, I know somebody sits on the corner. I know where he's a crippled person. I know where this is or that is. Go heal them. See, that's that same devil. Yes, it is. Jesus was questioned. Listen to what he said in St. John 5, 19. Verily, verily, I say unto you, and verily means absolutely, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Amen. See, he never did nothing until first he saw the Father showing that in the vision. That made him the God prophet. And if today he's still the same, the same God prophet, the same Holy Spirit that's dwelling amongst the people. We have received him in the form of the baptism. 
We've received him in praying for the, each other. We saw him and speak with other languages. We've seen him interpret it. We've seen him do these great signs in the day. And now we're moving on into something else. We've had a lot of impersonation. We've had a lot of these things, but that doesn't take it away from the Bible truth. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's alive forevermore. He said a little while, and the world, that's cosmos, the world order, the ordinary denominational group, will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I, and I is a personal pronoun, I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world, to the confirmation. Ah, I, I myself will be in you, working my same works that I did. All the way to the consummation, the end time, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, help us to believe it. Now, I would ask you a question. If he will appear here in our midst tonight, now, I want you to know this, that there is no such a thing as a divine healer, no more than there is a divine Savior. On earth today, he is here in the form of the Holy Spirit. And he's only here to confirm what he's already promised. He's here making his word manifest. When he came the first time, he proved that he was Messiah by what he was doing. It proved it was Messiah. Now, he said, as it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, in the days of Noah, the water came. In the days of Lot, the fire came. What are we looking for now? Fire. Watch how he proved himself. He came down. There was Lot down in Sodom, the lukewarm church member, half backslidden. And there was a three angels that came from heaven and came first to Abraham, who represented the called out group out of that Sodom. It's already been called out. And two of the angels went down in Sodom and preached. Never done very much miracles. A modern Billy Graham. But he identified himself as being a servant of God. And immediately after Lot came out, the lukewarm left the city, then fire destroyed the place. But notice, what type of one stayed with Abraham? Notice. Now, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. 25 years they'd believe that promise of a coming son, holding on to it. That's where he comes to those who's believing, holding to that promise. And watch. The two went down. The one that stayed with Abraham identified himself. He was sitting with his back to the tent. And remember, he had been Abram until just a day or two before that. And Sarah been S-A-R-A. Now she's S-A-R-A-H, and he's A-B-R-A-H-A-M, Abraham. And notice him, he called him, not his first name, his given name, a day or two before, Abraham. Where is your wife, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, princess? He said, she's in the tent behind you. Now he had his back to the tent. And he said, Abraham, I, <laughs> I'm going to visit you. <laughs> According to the promise that he made him. See who he was? And he said, uh, and Sarah, your wife's going to have this baby. And Sarah, in the tent behind him, the Bible designates she was behind him. In the tent, she laughed to herself. And the angel said, why did Sarah laugh? See? Why did Sarah laugh? Knowing what she was doing in the tent behind. See what I mean? And when Abraham went out, let him out, he went on his road, Abraham said that he talked to God, Elohim. What? Elohim, the all-sufficient one. What was it a sign of? What did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. That, that was, somebody said to me, Brother Branham, you don't believe that was God, do you? The Bible said it was God. And that's all I know. He said it was God. What was the sign of that God in the last days before the world is destroyed, he will appear in the called out group, God 
God identifying himself in human flesh among his people. Here he is. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, it isn't a question whether he's healed or not. It's a question whether he's alive or not. If he's alive, he keeps his promise. If it isn't, it's just a mythical story that we've read from somewhere, and that's all there is to it. I believe that he's alive tonight Amen. among us. Do you believe that? Amen. I have no clock. I don't see. My watch is broke, and I, I don't know what time it is, but someone tell me what time it is. Fifteen to ten. I'm, 15, I'm right now 45 minutes late. I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Let's bow our heads just a moment. I'm asking you a question. The scriptures, weeks from now, we could be staying on that same subject. It's the identification that Jesus is here. Sirs, we would see Jesus. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you could see him move into our midst tonight and do just the same things right here that he did when he walked in Galilee, would you believe him? If you would raise your hand, say, I would believe. I could just see him do the same thing that he did there. Our Heavenly Father, it's such a lovely group of people. They're so responsive. And I, I, we're so happy ministers, Lord, to see people who respond to the gospel. It means that there's a sign, a sound of a rushing wind in the air. It might be the thing that we prayed for here in Tucson to see a great revival. We are here to identify ourselves as your servants, as a true witness of the Bible. And we know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh in the among us. And we know this Bible expresses God's thoughts to his people. And a word is a thought expressed. Lord, may the meditation that's on my heart that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. May the Holy Spirit help tonight to express that word, that it will become a living article right among us, that we will see that Jesus is alive. By doing so, Lord, I believe that the audience of people will receive him. The ones that are not saved will want that wonderful Savior to know that after 2,000 years, here's his promise, just as live tonight as it was the hour he made it. And the sick will be healed. The saints will be blessed. We feel that the revival that we pray for will be on the way. Lord, this is as far as any man can go. Just say what you have said. Now we want you to come, dear Jesus, and express to us tonight your presence, that we all might know that you're here. And it'll thrill our hearts, Lord, to know that as we walk down the street, it'll make all of us think the next time we start to do anything or think things wrong, we know that you're watching us. We know that you're here. We know it's totally impossible, Lord, for this to happen without you. So we pray that you'll grant it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we give out prayer cards every day. And now we can't take them all at once, and we're a little late. I, I believe that we're supposed to close this by 10 o'clock. And um, we'll just call a few prayer cards and pray for some of the sick people. And maybe the Holy Spirit will grant something among us. I want every person to sit perfectly still. Keep your quietness just as quiet as you can be. Hold your place. And then remember, pray. Now, let's see. We start from just anywhere. Uh, Billy's somewhere here. If I just see where he's at, he give out prayer cards. I don't know what he give out. Oh, he's back in the shadow back there. Uh, what? A's one to a hundred. All right. Uh, let uh, eight or ten stand up. A number one. Who has prayer card A number one? If you can't get up, well, we'll pack it. We'll stitch you. A number one. Let's see. Uh, which way? You better come this way, I guess, or this way. All right. A number one. Would you go right over there, ladies? Some. A number two. Who has two? Number two. <clears throat> I know it's the, the Spanish people here. Number two. Would you hold up your hand so we can see where you're at? A number two. A gentleman back there. Would you come here, sir? Number three. 
Number three, holding prayer card three. Would you hold your hand up? A lady, would you come out over here, a lady, if you will, three, four, who has prayer card four? Would you hold your hand up there? This gentleman here, right here. All right. Number five. All right. Over here, six. Who has prayer card six? Number six. Somebody say it in Spanish. Say. Say. Prayer card six. I hope. See, look at your neighbor's prayer card. It might be somebody deaf and can't hear it. You see, they miss their turn. We want everybody to be prayed for. So now, um, see if you're holding prayer cards. Or six. They might, there's some left here a few moments ago, so it might have been I uh, preached too long or talked too long, or they never preached, but they, they might have got weary. Six, seven. Seven, would you hold up your hand? Seven, eight, nine, that's right, good. Nine, nine, nine. Prayer card nine. Is a little boy, you have prayer card nine, Sonny? Eight, all right, that's fine. Number eight. Nine. Um, now, when you get prayer cards, look, don't, don't, uh, don't just take them, you see, and, and don't come up because you rob somebody of that place, you see. And you've you got to come and get your own prayer card. See, somebody come and gets one, gives it to somebody else, and they get up and go out, and then you see somebody misses that place where somebody could have come in. All right? The six and nine, it's out. Who can say it in Spanish right loud? <laughs> All right, everyone that was. All right, that's fine. All right, if that prayer card is here. Uh, all right, does that lady have that? A six or nine? You Six? Good. All right, nine now. Who has prayer card nine? They left, all right. All right, let's start here then, all right? Uh, start the prayer line and stuff. Now, <clears throat> and then we're, we're rushed a little bit, so don't be nervous now. We'll be out about 10, 15 minutes. But I want to ask you something. That's it, brother. Now, I wish you would just a little bit of room there if you, if you possibly will. <clears throat> Thank you. The brother just come told me we didn't have to be out of ten, so that's fine. Well, if we don't want to wear the people, here's the, here's the thing. As far as I can see, now how many out there does not have prayer cards and yet you're sick? Raise up your hand. Does not have prayer cards? Well, it's just all right. You don't have to have a prayer card. You have to have faith. See? Prayer card is just something you're holding your hand. See? You, it's just a card with a number on it. That's all there is. A card with a number. One, two, three, or whatever it is. And sometimes we, each day we give out new cards because these people come in and we start from one place to another. So how many is ever in one of the meetings before? Let's see your hand. Oh. <laughs> Well, I thought I was before a strange audience and then talk on something like that. See, Well, no, there's two-thirds in here has been the meetings before. All right, you understand what way we do it. Now, I do not see a person at this time that I could say that I know. I, I might know some of you, but there's no one that I see that I know. I can't see one person. And I, I know my wife's in here somewhere and one of my daughters, but... And, uh, I, but I don't know where she's at even. She's in here somewhere. But I, I don't, and I know that I heard Brother Fred Sothman, one of our trustees of the church in Indiana, say amen a while ago. But I, the Heavenly Father knows I can't even see the man. It's kind of hard to see from here. I don't even know where he's at. I see no one. I know none of you. But the, and all in this prayer line, you in the prayer line, all of you that doesn't know me, or you know that I don't know you, raise up your hands. Did you know? All right. A whole group of them. I don't know them, they don't know me, you don't know me, and I don't know you. Now, the thing of it is now, is Jesus Christ alive? That's what we want to know, see? And now, we can't even, there, there's many things that we could say, yes, I feel him in my heart, that people say something else. And they say, uh, many things, they say, yes, psychology. But we want to know, is he truly alive to scripturally identify himself the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what we want to know. Now, here is the, the Word of God. And I hold it in my hand. There's not a person that I can see outside of my son now and Brother Tony sitting down here, brother, uh, president of the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship, 
is the only two people that I see that I know. The little singers are sitting out there at the end. I, I think they're very fine. I believe this is her mother sitting right here. I'm not sure. Or, or is that right? Am I wrong? Well, I'm wrong there. So I, I don't know. I seen a lady playing. Is this here at the piano? Well, I seen a lady the other night playing up there. It looked a whole lot like this lady here that I thought was uh, the mother. Of the, of the, there she is. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, now you'll have to say they look a whole lot alike. That's right. But I, see, I didn't even know that lady. Now, therefore, I stand here with ministers around me, behind me, out front, Christian people, and here we stand here. And I claim that the Bible evidence of Jesus Christ is a prophetic sign. The Bible says so. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And promised that if we believe on him, the works that he did, we would do also. Now, is that true? Now, if that is the truth, every sinner ought to find himself here at the altar, a place here, and ask forgiveness of sin. Every sick person ought to accept your healing right where you're at. Because there's no virtue in me. I'm a man. Here's your pastor. just the same as I. We're just servants of Christ. But we're here. Now, there, there are preachers. I'm not very much of a preacher. You know that by now. But I, I, there are ministers, teachers, and so forth. I'm not a minister, preacher, rather, because I have no education uh, and no schooling, and I have no degrees of, uh, and what, uh, no BAs or DDs. Or, I, I just don't have it. And I, 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 but the Lord gave me a, a gift. Because I love him. And he, he lets me work for him in this way. And if he will manifest himself here, that he is here. And if this very Holy Spirit that you receive proves that it is him. Pentecost is the only thing that's going to prove Christianity. You can't prove it by science. You can't prove it by nothing but by a Pentecostal experience. You Baptists know that. You Methodists and Presbyterians and whatever you are. You know, it takes Pentecostal experience to prove God. And that's to each individual. It doesn't prove the organization. It proves the individual. Like Jesus said to Peter when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. He said, Flesh and blood never reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell can never tear it down, and not prevail against it. Now, where is the, this lady? Now, if Jesus Christ proves that he's alive, how many is going to accept your healing right where you're sitting? Just raise your hand and say, I, I, if he'll do just what he did here, I know he's alive. Brother Branham, I, I heard you speak. I know you, <laughs> you're just a little bald-headed preacher standing there, see? And I know there's nothing in you. But I, I do know if you've told the truth, God will certainly testify of it. He's obligated to do that. Now, I've spoke of him. Now, let him speak that I've told you the truth. If it isn't the truth, then it isn't the truth. If it is the truth, then you accept it. A lady here, I, I've never seen her. She raised her hands a few minutes ago that we were strangers to one another. She might have heard of me somewhere in a paper, a magazine, or might have seen me in a meeting. But it's knowing anything about the woman, the first, only thing I know, I've probably never met her before in life. She's standing here a total stranger. Say, this happens to be something I talked of a few moments ago. Here's a man and a woman meet for the first time, like St. John, the fourth chapter, when our Lord Jesus Christ met the woman at the well, right on a panoramic the same way. Just the Bible portrayed again. Jesus never knew her. She never knew Jesus. She questioned him, asking her, and, and he asked her for a drink of water. And then when the Father revealed to him what was her trouble... Quickly, she recognized that that was more than just an ordinary man. Now, lady, I, I don't know you. I don't know one thing about you. But I'm just speaking to you in order you being the first person to catch the Spirit of the Lord. And now, I perceive that you are a believer. And I mean a Christian believer, not a hitchhiker, because immediately when I turn to you, your spirit vibrates welcome. See, I know that she's a Christian. And she could be a hypocrite. She could be anything. She could be a deceiver standing there. How would I know? I've never seen her in my life. But now, if, if this repeats itself, that he knows where your trouble is, he knows what you're here for. It might be sickness, it might be financial trouble, it might be domestic trouble. I, I don't know. He does. But if he will reveal to me by his presence and let 
my mind and lips and all be so carried by him that he'll tell you what you're here for. You know whether it's be the truth or not, wouldn't you? You know it, whether it's true. How many would believe it? Now here I am with my hands up too. I never seen her in my life, as far as I know. Never seen her in my life. We're totally strangers one to another. Now if the Holy Spirit can reveal to this woman something about her, something she's done, like that woman did at the well, then or something that she ought to have done and did not do, some trouble she's had, something's on her heart, something she wants, or something like that, it had to come from some supernatural power. How many knows that? Well, now, you could take the side of the Pharisees and say, it's the devil. Or you could take the side of the believer and say, it's God. Then it depends on you. It's up to you. Now, let may the Holy Spirit speak. Now, if you who are controlling these uh, microphones sometime, when uh, the anointing comes down, that uh, I don't know how loud I'm talking. You see where I have to stand now? I either have to stand with this word, and I've declared that it's the truth, now, I've got to depend on God declaring that back, that it's the truth, right here before these people. I did it before half a million. God did it, rather. Let me speak. In the Bombay Indian, for 250,000 in South Africa at the racetrack, when 30,000 blanket natives received Christ, and 25,000 men and stretchers and everything got up and walked away at the same time. That was, that was idol worshippers. What ought to do to a born again group that believes God and looking for something like Amen. that? Twenty-five thousand miracles performed just at one time. That's all they wanted to see as soon as it happened. What ought to do to us? I, my sister, we are two people born in different parts of the world, perhaps, and meeting our first time here now. And I. I just want to speak to you in order, if he will reveal to me, as we're all waiting to see what happens. Now, it has to be to him, because I, I don't know you. I've never seen you. But God does know you. But now, if the congregation who's ever seen that light, that picture of the angel Lord, how many's ever seen it? All right, here it is, right here between me and the woman right now. Didn't you see that? Yeah. Moves to her. You see it? See, the woman's looking at herself. A woman has complications. She has many things wrong with her. One of the main things that's wrong with her is a gallbladder condition. That is true. Now, if that's right, raise up your hand. Now, you believe? And he's the same yesterday and forever, isn't he? You believe that, brother? I keep feeling that comes somebody said he guessed that. I didn't guess that. Uh, See, so you can't hide yourself now. The Holy Spirit's here. What you're thinking, I catch it. Jesus perceived their thoughts, you see. And I ain't Jesus, but he's here with us. Uh, here, I don't know you. If Jesus would tell me who you are, then I'd already take the question out of him for all time. Wouldn't I? Mrs. Heineman, go on your road, you're healed. Jesus Christ. Uh, you believe now? You say, that woman's name, what didn't he tell Simon what his name was, who his father was? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe it? How do you do, sir? Here's a man that I have never seen in my life. I suppose we're strangers to one another. That's right. So if the people know, just raise up your hand so the people can see that we're strangers. I've never seen the man. He looks like he, he was... Healthy enough? I don't know the man. I've never seen him. God knows all about him. Now, if he was sick and I could heal him, wouldn't I be an awful person if I didn't heal him? But I couldn't heal him because I can't do what Christ has already done. He's already healed if he's sick. It's just something to me. If Jesus was standing right here with this suit on it, he gave me. He could not heal you. He'd tell you he'd already done it. He was wounded for our transgression with his strength. He'd ask you if you believe it. But he could identify himself that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's just what he's doing. Yeah? Right. Now, here's the man. The other was a woman. I've never seen him, met him. We're just strangers. Your owner. Now, sir, 
if the great Holy Spirit, which you're conscious right now, something happened right then, didn't it? Now, that light settled right over the man. Just ask him. I want you to know this. Just a second ago, a real sweet, humble feeling come over me. Is that right? Raise your hand if that's right. I'm looking right at it. There it is. All right. The man is a tiny, he's been hard hearing in his ears, but he's had a serious something happen to him. He's had an operation for a rupture. That's what you're wanting me to pray for. That's right. Raise up your hand. All right. Is that right? You believe that? Now, see, you don't guess those things. They're true. Here, he's got something on his heart. You want to believe whether it's God or not? There's something else on your heart. Something you're wanting. There's somebody out here in the audience suffering too. It's your wife. That's right. She's got complications and misery and pain right now. Isn't that right? All right, sister, you're healed too. Both of you go home. Jesus Christ. Go on your own, rejoice and thank God. Amen. Believe now. Have faith. Don't doubt. Believe. All things are possible to them that believe. See, I cannot heal. I'm no healer. But Jesus Christ has proven himself that he's here with you. This kind of an Indian or Mexican lady looking at me right here suffering with high blood pressure. You believe Jesus Christ? I don't know. You have never seen. Is that right? But you were sitting there. You were believing that, wasn't you? Raise up on your feet if that's so. If you suffer with high blood pressure, Jesus Christ healed you. What happened there? You say, Brother Bram, that's not scripture. Yes, it is. A woman touched his garment. Is that right? Now, how many of you ministers and you people believe this? That the Bible says that he is now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? How would you know you touched him? Because he acted the same way he did yesterday. Amen. Makes him the same yesterday, today, and forever. That poor little woman sitting there. See? Her faith. This woman one time went through a crowd of people. And she touched his garment. For she said within herself, I believe that the man is truthful. I believe he's the son of God. And if I can just touch the border of his garment, I'll be made healed. Well, how many knows the story? Well, then... If he, the Bible says in the New Testament, book of Hebrews, that he is a high priest that right now can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How do we know we touched him? Because he acts the same way he did yesterday. Now, you know the woman never touched me. She's 30 feet from me. But she touched that high priest who we're in contact with. There you are. Each one of you can do that if you just believe it. Amen. You see, he's the same. Now, ask the little woman. I've never seen her, never know her. She's just a woman sitting there. Excuse me. We're strangers one to another, but Jesus Christ knows both of us. You believe that he can reveal to me something that you have done, something that you're desiring? Would it make you know that uh, me, just your brother, I wouldn't know that. It'd have to come from some power. Would you believe it to be Jesus Christ? You would do it. I believe you would, because you're a Christian. Right. You you believe me now. And now, will the audience believe with all their heart? You believe that the hour that we're living in, that these things are supposed to come right now? Remember, that was the last sign that Israel had before she was... What was taken was taken. What was left was left. That was the last sign just before the fire fell. Is that right? We've had signs, wonders, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, divine healing. But what was the last sign before Sodom burned? This very thing you're seeing tonight, God manifesting himself in human flesh, knowing the secret of the heart. Jesus Christ said so, as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. See, you're looking at the woman, you're reading her mind, I'll turn my back to her in the Don't think I ain't catching what you're thinking, because I am. All right, lady, you just come up here now, so I'll look up and I'll catch someone else. Now, we are total strangers. But if Jesus Christ can reveal to me what your trouble is, will you believe it if you will raise up your hand? I see you're extremely nervous. That's right. And especially that happens in the late of the afternoon when you get tired and wore out. Everything seems to go strange to you. You're suffering also with arthritis. That's so wave your hand. 
See? And I notice that when you're, when you're trying to get out of the bed, you go real slow. When you get up in the morning, it's kind of hard for you at that time. That's true. Something strange. I see a, a man, a young man, appearing here. It's your son, and he's suffering from a mental condition. And the mental condition was caused by domestic trouble. That's thus saith the Lord. That's true, isn't it? You believe now? Then go find it the way you believe. God be with you. Have faith and believe. You'll be all right. You believe with all your heart? Sure. He knows all about you. How do you do, sir? We're strangers to each other, I suppose. The Lord Jesus knows both of us. We are two men met here for the first time in life. But there's someone here don't, shaking. That's just weakness, you see. I spoke for an hour or more. It didn't hurt me. But just one vision. That doesn't. How many fields you understand that? Daniel saw one vision, was trouble in his head for many days. Jesus preached all night and everything, but one little woman touched his garment. And he said, I perceive that virtue has gone from me. Is that right? That strength. And if it would do that to the Son of God, what would it do to me, a sinner? See, it does something to you. Frankly, the whole audience now is just becoming like a blur. See? I don't know you, but God does know you. But if he will reveal to me what's in your heart, then he, Jesus, perceived their very thoughts. He knows your heart. And if he can reveal to you your desires, would you believe you would receive it? How many out there would believe you would receive it? That ought to settle it if you believe it. Something on your arm shows that you have a high blood pressure. That's right. But it's got a cause. And the cause is from a garter. Rule. That's right. You believe me to be his prophet or his servant, brother? You believe he knows you? You're wanting to be healed for a good cause. You want to be a missionary. Your post is being Central America. Is that right? So you believe you believe with all yourself. Believe with all your heart. Go and receive your healing. Jesus Christ will make you well. You believe? How many believe that Jesus is the same yesterday and forever? You believe he's here? Now, let me give you another scripture. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. Is that right? In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they would take up serpents or drink deadly things, it would not harm them. If they lay their hands upon the sick, they shall recover. How many knows that's true? Amen. What was his last words that fell from his lips as he was taken up? If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Is that right? Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. How many believers are in here? Let's see. All right. Now, if you want to see the miracle of God... Believe that this, what I'm telling you, and you see manifested, is Jesus Christ. And then lay your hands over on one another. Just put your hands over on one another. No matter what's wrong, just lay your hands on somebody next to you. Now, see, it just isn't a me. It's you. These signs didn't say just will follow William Branham. It said will follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick. Now... Are you satisfied Jesus is alive and among us? Say amen. amen. Well, he that made the promise is here. Now, you pray for the person that you got your hands on. See? You pray for them. See? Don't pray for yourself. You pray for them because they are praying for you. See? Now, you know he's here. He made the promise. And if he'll stand out here before the people and confirm it and prove it that it's true, then you believe it with all your heart. Now, I'm going to pray for all of you. And while you pray for one another, let's believe now with all of our hearts. Our Heavenly Father, 
We are indeed, our hearts are thrilled. You are here tonight. There is no place too humble, no place too great, no place too far, but what you have come to your believing children. Oh, great God of heaven, you have sent Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit, which is here now, and identifying himself the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the children are believing it. I've given in your word. You have confirmed your word. Now, there's many sick here, and they're, they're thrilled. They're happy. They have their hands, these believers, these believing children, have their hands laid up on their sick brother or sister. They are believing. They're praying for he or she. And God, you made the promise. It's your word. Now, as your servant, I bring this uh, service to this place that we as believers come to challenge the devil that he's bluffed up around as much as he's going to. We believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's alive and here with us tonight. And we are following his commandments for laying our hands on one another. Satan, turn them loose, come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Let this audience of people go for the glory of God. Turn them loose, Satan. We adjure thee by the presence of Jesus Christ, the living one, the resurrected Son of God. Leave them going. Come out of them for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Every person present that feels that Jesus Christ has kept his word, that he's come in our midst, that he's here because he promised to be here. He's here and identified himself. He's the same Lord Jesus that walked in Galilee. And you believe that he keeps all of his word. And because somebody, a believer, identified himself with you by laying his hands upon you to identify himself with the word of God, that you are now healed and you resent Satan holding you any longer, your faith goes loose to believe that God is sure to keep his word. Stand on your feet and accept your healing. All that believe it. Rise up to your feet. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Raise up your hands and praise him now. You are healed in the name of Jesus.